Saturday afternoon meditation class. And this is the ongoing class for those who are uh, uh, meditated enough, so they know the basic instructions. And on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, we usually say something about the deeper aspects of meditation. And the aspect today I wanted to just to talk about is energy. Uh, I know this very much because I've just returned from a quite a grueling uh, talk. I call it a talk show a tour through Indonesia. Many flights, much hard work, late nights, early mornings. And sometimes when you run out of energy and you feel really, really tired, one of the greatest ways of getting that energy back is by just learning how to be very, very still. Because the more still you are, the more energy comes into your mind. Uh, it is an insight which uh, came up in my meditation many years ago, and you always think that you discover these insights, but later on you look in the, the ancient meditation texts and see that many people have been there before you and discovered that when the mind is very, very still, it does build up a huge boost of energy. But the trouble is trying to keep it still. That's a difficulty. And if you train yourself to be still, it's very easy to arouse that energy. Now, what is actually happening is that the mind has two parts to it, the active mind, which is always thinking, doing, making things work, whatever. That active mind consumes so much energy. And if you could just block that wastage of energy, that wastage into thinking, planning, remembering, doing, thinking, if you can just block that off and stop that for a little while, then all the energy goes into the mind's knowing. It gives it energy, it gives it power. And you can come out of meditation afterwards feeling like a different person, tired before, but really awake and sharp afterwards. And that's something which I use very often in a very busy lifestyle which I live these days. And it's something which you can do, because so many people do have that innate tiredness. Uh, Maybe not on a Saturday, from Monday to Friday, you work hard. On the weekends, you have all other duties which uh, you tend to have to perform. And sometimes we feel inside, there's this tiredness inside of us. I remember first discovering that in that seminar which I gave about doing my final exams at university. Sitting down during the lunch hour, meditating, and just realizing after doing a three-hour examination in the morning, just meditating, how tired my brain was. It had no juice left at all. It was just worn out. It was just tired. You know, and it's, I realized when you had a look at that type of brain, just how it can't perform very well. But I had enough insight, even at that time, to learn how to keep the mind absolutely still, especially to stop that internal commentary, you know, which goes on all the time, you know, the inner speech, to stop that, to stop all the worry, to stop all the fear, and to keep the mind perfectly still for a few minutes. And to notice that's all it took, just a few minutes of stillness. And that tiredness, after having completed a three-hour exam in the morning, that whole tiredness vanished. And the afternoon you were bright and fresh. And since that time I've used this technique very often to give yourself a boost of energy when you, you know you have to perform and you're very tired. And it also taught me that so many physical, emotional, social problems arise in our life because we are tired. Because you know, we work so hard and some other person gives us another task, another problem, and then we blow up in frustration and anger. Sometimes at other people, sometimes at ourselves. It gives us a lot of very hard stress in our lives. And it's not a very wonderful thing for you to do. It is a wonderful thing to learn how to deal with that by learning just the skill of stillness. The skill of stillness, so you can just stop whenever you want and allow the mind to regenerate its energy. That's all. Not solving the problems, but just giving your mind this power to see through and past the problems. You don't take the problem and work out the solution. That is just more thinking. It ties you out. Just stop. Be still. Put everything aside. And let the mind energize until it gets so strong that the problems are very easy to find a way around. 
Now that is what meditation does. But the skill is learning how to be still. Learning how to be still, that word stillness, I often give the simile of like a lake. If you move the lake, in other words, it's ripples in, I say, I've got to keep this lake still. I've got to get rid of the waves and the ripples. So you put your hand in and try and pat down the waves or try and smooth out the ripples. What happens is you just make more waves. The skill of stillness is learning to take your hands away. Take your hands off the steering wheel of your life. Take your feet off the pedals. To let go, to do nothing, and to keep this mind perfectly inactive. Now you can do that with your body. I remember even at primary school. You know, I remember the time in primary school, grade one or grade two, the teacher said, pretend you're a tree. And everybody froze. And now the wind is blowing and then you can wave your arms around. But you can actually do that with your body. You can keep the body still. And you can use exactly the same sort of technique, a bit of imagination, a bit of decision, but focused on the mind to keep it still, to freeze it like a statue, like a tree, like a rock. And when you feel that stillness, you find energy starts to build up. But also it becomes very profound. It's a very beautiful feeling, stillness, peace. It's very much like that, you know, that experience which you probably have, that somebody's mowing the lawn sort of just uh, next to your room and you want to meditate or you want some peace and there's a dog barking or there's a party going on on Saturday night and you can't go to sleep and it drives you crazy and then suddenly the party stops and they turn the, the amplifiers down and it's peaceful again. Ah, oh, what joy. Quiet, stillness at last. Now that's the sort of joy which you can get when this, this uh, ghetto blaster of a mind which you have inside. Always thinking, always doing things, always never shutting up. Like that lawnmower in your neighbor's property or the dog always barking. When that dog between your ears stops barking and at last becomes still. Wow, that's beautiful. That's incredible, that's lovely. So once the mind stops, you have to sort of imagine it freezing first of all. But once it does stop, it feels so wonderful, so delightful, that the delight will mean you don't have to keep trying to keep it still. Because you're delighting in the stillness, because it feels beautiful, you just want to carry on being still. And that's the delight in the stillness will mean it will last much longer than you could ever hold it. You start off with holding the stillness, and then the delight means you don't have to hold it anymore. You just rest there, simply because it's delightful. And the longer you can stay in that delightful stillness, the more the energy of the mind builds up. And actually the delight increases with the energy. As the mind sort of re-energizes itself, the happiness, the joy increases. The mind becomes clear. It becomes powerful again. So you find that after those meditations, you can think clearly. You can do things without making mistakes. And you're not just on the edge of getting angry with the people you love. Because you relax, you're soft again. When the mind is tired, it's brittle. Just the slightest crack, slightest hit will crack it. But when the mind is very energized, it's like soft. It's just like a rubber ball, it's just bouncy. But you drop it, it doesn't break like a plate. It bounces, it's unbreakable, no one can upset it. That's my mind which is still and energized. And just learning how to use that stillness of meditation you know, in your everyday life, you do find you're a much easier person to live with. You don't respond with anger, you're not sort of on edge all the time. But most importantly, it's much easier to live with yourself. You're more at peace with yourself, you're more soft, you haven't got so many sharp edges anymore. Because the stillness has softened everything. So if you think stillness, and just hold everything still, don't try and make stillness by, as I said, putting your hand on the lake and trying to smooth out the ripples. 
Just stop. Imagine stillness. Imagine a statue. Imagine a lake which is glassy smooth. Imagine, I just, I'm really getting into my imagination now. I would never forget one time when I was visiting our new monastery in England, must have been 30, 30, over 30 years ago now, I can't remember. And this was in south of England during the winter time, during January. And there was a really heavy snowfall that winter. It was about minus 30 degrees. And I remember just going out early in the morning. As they say, only mad dogs and monks go out in the early morning snow. <laughs> and I went out in the early morning snow and no one else was around. No animals were, f were flying in the air. No animals were scurrying on the ground. There was no wind. It was perfectly still. For some people would call it like, like dead, like a grave. But for me it was incredibly beautiful and powerful. When I stopped walking, there was no more crunch of you know, boots on snow. Everything stopped. Nothing moved in the forest in winter and the early morning. And to me that was magic. It was so powerful and delightful. It was only the freezing cold <laughs> made me sort of come back and have some breakfast. But no, the magic of the quiet early morning in the snow. So still. Nothing moved. There was no noise. That was amazing. I love that stillness. It energizes, it delights, and you go back full of energy. Thinking and working, and I'm not talking physical work, I'm talking all that mental work, that tires you out and depresses you sometimes. But the stillness, imagine that type of stillness, and the mind delights in it. The stillness grows and you get incredible energy. So that's how to energize the mind. Okay, so uh, that's just a little bit of intro to the meditation. Uh, again, I always have to say, is anyone who's coming here for the introduction to meditation class, that is being held in the room on my right, isn't it? Yeah, today. Actually, it's the last, unless it's a joint one today. Next week, so this is a joint, this is everybody. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Anyway, you're here now, so welcome. <laughs> so we're now going to start the meditation. So if you'd like to um, get yourselves ready, if you sort of want to stretch something and wiggle your bottom or whatever, please do so, and we can start the meditation now. So the meditation usually goes on for about 45 minutes. So those of you who uh, came for an introductory class, because it's the fifth Saturday of the month, so there's no introductory meditation class. Please, you can join in. If you feel you're, you need to move, just after 15 or 20 minutes, just quietly move the body and just get into another position and carry on again. So for those of you who are experts, or not experts, who cares, just sit down, close your eyes, and when your eyes are closed, Bring the attention onto your body to know how the body feels. So it's not making plans for dinner this evening. It's not remembering all the things which went wrong this morning or early in the week. It's putting the attention on your body right now. How does it feel? And when you are aware of your body, you will doubtless find that some parts of your body need adjusting. The bottom might not be perfectly positioned on the chair or cushion. So please fidget. Move to make the body more comfortable. And even experiment. Move my bottom a little bit, is this better? Actually, yeah, it is. Move the legs, so your legs are just as comfortable as possible. Because in meditation we have to keep this position for quite a long time. So if we take care in getting it right at the beginning, it's much easier to sit for long periods of time. And 
And even though I've been meditating for such a long time, still I always spend five or ten minutes with my body at the beginning. And then, once the external body is well adjusted, there's usually some discomfort inside. I know today I've got a bit of a tummy ache. So I put all my attention on that feeling, not trying to get rid of it, not trying to escape from it. So going deep inside that feeling, and then just willing it to relax with this beautiful kindness. If you use the combination of awareness and kindness, I mean real kindness, 100% compassion and acceptance, you'll usually find those inner feelings will ease off. The awareness gives you feedback the in my internal tummy ache, the feeling is often changing. And when I use kindness, I can see it change to being more at ease, less sore. And when the body is nice and relaxed, and any internal feelings are also expanded, loosened, softened, you feel you're ready to start the relaxing of the inner world and let go of the body and put your attention, your focus on the mental world, the world of thoughts and emotions, all that which you associate with the inner world. And that mental world is very tired. You've been doing a lot, thinking a lot, having to respond to many difficulties and problems. Now pull all those difficulties and problems aside. Time to rest. To do that, you recognize that most of the difficulties and problems, most of the work, in the mental world concerns the past or the future. So we make a deliberate intention and effort to keep the mind still in the present moment. Doesn't matter what happened in the past, it can't be changed, it's gone, it's not a good place to visit. 
we move on. And as for the future, who knows what might happen. In fact, as I always say, the only time you can do anything for your future is right now. In this moment which you're experiencing, this is the place your future is being made. So focus on this present moment. You make it still, peaceful, beautiful. That's the best we can do for planning our future. Making the mind peaceful in the present. So come home. Come from the journey of the future. Come from all the memories of the past. And come home into the present. And number one, be a friend to this present moment. Don't try and control it. This moment is not in your power. We believe the future is in our power, but the present moment has already come. It's here as it is. So don't try and control this moment. Just be at one with it, as a friend. And then the present moment will stay. And the mind will lose its interest in mulling over the past. It will lose its addiction to worrying about the future. It will rest in this moment. The first level of stillness. A stillness in time.
wants the mind to stay long enough in the present moment to focus on freezing that inner commentary. So there's no noise between the ears. The inner commentary stops. Imagine the mind is a tree, a rock, or the still forest pool. In delight, enjoy the stillness. The noise stops. Peace, beautiful golden silence at last. If you wish to start watching your breathing, just to know the breath, just to know it as it comes in, without controlling it at all. 
And just to be aware of the breath as it goes out. Allowing the mind to travel with your breathing. The mind, the awareness, holding hands with the breath is a way of focusing in stillness.
getting very close to the end of the meditation. How do you feel? What's it like inside? This is a result of stillness, freeing the mind from the body. The body just sits there happily, tending to the nature of the mind, bringing it peace and stillness. From this stillness, energy and clarity. I'm now going to ring the gong three times. Please listen to every sound from the gong. And only after the third ringing of the gong fades away. Only then open your eyes to end the meditation. meditation but as you know these this is streamed live all over the world into outer space so we haven't got any questions today dear Ajahn there is no relevant web-based question today so that means that everybody listening to today's talk was so still and so peaceful not even a question formed in their mind that's what happens when you're still. Everything is really, really peaceful. Many people tell me that, that sometimes they come with all their questions. When they come into a temple or do some meditation or hear a good talk, it's not that all their questions get answered, but all their questions disappear. They just fade away and vanish. And everything is nice and peaceful and still. That's, that's what used to happen to me made all these appointments with all these great masters and sometimes I say masters, now we have uh, nuns. You can't say you're a master anymore. So the nuns, they're mistresses. That's just like in university. You know, when you get sort of your second degree, you're a master of education, a master of arts, a master of science. But when a woman gets it, she's a mistress of arts. <laughs> mistress of science. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> but... You ask one of the great sort of experts. And I made appointments in my young life to meet these people. And as soon as you go in their presence, all your questions vanished. They disappeared. It was replaced with stillness. Because stillness is the answer to all the questions. When the mind becomes peaceful and still, what more do you want? And just to get a feeling and experience of what stillness is, just like I remember reading all these articles about peace of mind and stuff like that. And these were all philosophical articles, people thinking about peace, but never really experiencing it. It's the experience which is more important than anything else. Which is why I used to give the old simile of the professor and the restaurant. You don't know that simile because sometimes I only do it on a Friday night, not on a Saturday afternoon, it's two different clientele. Though once it was a professor, a professor of philosophy at our local university, and he heard there was a new five-star restaurant opened up in Perth. So he decided to make a reservation. And it was such an elite 
restaurant. He had to wait two months before he could get his reservation. And when the two months came up and there was a night for his reservation, he dressed in a very good suit because he had a dress code in these great restaurants. He turned up and the maitre d' asked for his identification and saw, yes, he had a reservation that night, so led him to his table, this beautiful Java table with no silver candlesticks, the whole works. And a waiter dressed in tails came and give, give, gave him the menu. And the menu was just... And not what you get in McDonald's, but th printed on a thick card in this gold calligraphy. Even the menu was a work of art. So the professor said, thank you for the menu. And when the waiter left, the professor ate the menu and paid and left. <laughs> because the professor never knew the difference between the menu and the food. If you understand that simile, you understand why all the questions and all the words and all the philosophy and all the arguments and all this talking, that's the menu. And the food is what happens when the mind becomes still. You're not looking at the menu anymore. You're eating the food. Peace of mind. Yeah, we can write PhDs on peace of mind and become a professor of peace <laughs> but we still don't understand what peace is so in meditation the mind becomes still we don't even need to say the word peace because as soon as you say the word peace the peace is gone you're just there being still experiencing peace immersing yourself in peace what a beautiful thing that is not to understand peace of mind, but to experience it, to be in it. And that's what meditation does. And the longer you're in that peace of mind, please don't disturb it. Too often what happens in meditation, people get into nice deep states, and they disturb it by trying to discuss it with themselves. What is this? What's happening? How is this? So when you're experiencing peace of mind, don't disturb it by saying something. And you've got into a beautiful, peaceful state. Enjoy. Just rest in it. Leave it alone. That's why one of the most common questions which people ask themselves, they get peaceful and they ask themselves, you know, it's a thought, what should I do next? <laughs> you know, that's the most stupid thought which comes up in meditation. It means you've lost the first stage of present moment awareness. There is no next, there's only the now. So if ever that question comes up in you, in your meditation, whatever you're experiencing, what should I do next? A little alarm bell should ring, a red flag should come up. Wrong question, you're missing the point. But it's not what you're doing next, it's what's happening now. And when what's happening now, there's no words to describe it, it's just here. The mind becomes silent, you become still, and you experience what peace of mind is. And the nice thing about peace of mind, it has all different levels. First of all, you think the mind is so peaceful, and then it goes into a deeper level of peace. And then a more peace, then it gets into ultimate peace, and then it gets into a peace even more than ultimate peace. It just keeps blowing the boundaries of what you think peace could be. And that's when the meditation really gets interesting. More peace you can ever imagine. That's why no philosopher could understand peace. Peace cannot be written on a menu. It's much more profound than that. So little by little in your meditation, as the mind becomes still, as the mind shuts up and stops saying things, it gets deeper and deeper, more and more still. And that's so much fun. And afterwards, after enjoying yourself to the max, you come out afterwards and your mind is energized. And whatever duty you have to do in this world, whether to give a talk about meditation, whether to go and drive a car or paint a masterpiece, you can do it. Your mind has got power. 
empowered by stillness. That's why I just come back from Indonesia. Many of my books have been translated into Bahasa, Bahasa Indonesia, and the meditation book, The Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. They changed the title of that to Super Power Mindfulness. That's the title of their, the, that same book, but translated into Indonesian. Super Power Mindfulness is a great title, because that's exactly what we create with stillness. Perfectly aware, but not just ordinary awareness. You feel it's got power to it. It's like you've been walking through life in the dark with a flashlight, whose batteries you know, need replacing. Now I've got many flashlights like that. <laughs> should get a new battery. But as a monk, we try to use everything to it, you know, really runs out. So we don't want to waste things. But then you get your new batteries. And you flash. so powerful is the beam. You can see everything. And that's just like the mind through stillness. You now the batteries in the mind, which are just almost worn down to zero, they're recharged. So whatever you look at, whatever you contemplate, even sounds you hear, you can hear so much more. You can feel. And it's great sometimes you feel things after meditation. You can actually feel texture. Just the body is alive, electric. And what you see outside, it's just like the whole world has been polished. And the darkness has been taken off and everything is shining. Just like you've just cleaned your house, it's sparkling. This is you just cleaned your mind through stillness and everything glistens like the raindrops in the sun. That's what happens when the mind becomes powered. Super power mindfulness. So, there we go, ad libbing again when there's no questions on the screen. So, have you got any questions which you might like to ask? Or is your mind just happy being still? Yes, my good friend. Ajahn, you once you said that you could use present moment awareness as an object of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, I find that when I can go into the present moment, I, um, my energy levels pick up. Um, I know that you've said it as part of a sequence to go into deeper places in meditation. Mm -hmm. You've also said that uh, when you're in deep places of meditation, you start to drift off, go back to the present moment awareness. Um, can you say something about using it uh, as a formal object of meditation? Yeah, um, it's, it's sometimes that in meditation we have the usual objects, when you call them, you know, the usual suspects of the breath or the body or loving kindness. But actually just to get to know what the present moment really means. Today I was talking about to get to know what peace of mind means. To use peace as the object of meditation. So all these other objects, whether it's metta or loving kindness or sort of uh, the breath or whatever, they are vehicles to get to a destination. The destination is peace, stillness. So you can use present moment awareness and get to know what it means to be in the present. Not to be able to describe it to anybody. That's why sometimes you experience these states of meditation and then as a teacher you've got to describe it. And that's just so hard. You know it. You've been there so many times. You can recognize it. But to describe it takes a skill of someone who has a great vocabulary. But to take as an object of meditation, just being here right now. And I think you mentioned at the beginning that sometimes the mind wanders off at first. It's tired. It's beautiful, wonderful, because it takes a time to settle into these things. Give yourself that time. My talk last night was like allowing yourself to make mistakes. Don't try and be so perfect, even in meditation. If you try to be perfect, and perfect in the present moment, perfect in this, you'll find that you're just creating more stress, more tightness, more force, which means you can't really stay in the present moment. So get to know it. And the trick which I found to be one of the most effective is look at these meditation objects as your friends. 
The present moment is not something I should try and grab hold of and capture like a hunter captures you know, the, the lion. It's something I befriend. So the lion walks beside me without any force. Ajahn, uh, when you, or when I, go into that space and I'm more successful rather than less successful in staying in the present moment, what uh, disappears is me and it would seem to me that that's very similar to the edge of jhana if you're right up on the leading edge of it. Am I correct in my assumptions there? The most important thing you said is that you disappear. Yeah. And that is the most important thing. This uh, a very old Buddhist meditation manual called the Visuddhimaka. And it's written about 1,500 years ago about meditation. Some of it is a bit sort of wacky. But there is one of the favorite poems in that, which I often quote. And it said, the path is, but no traveler on it is seen. It's a beautiful little quote there. So meditation exists. It's a path. But if you, the traveler, exists in meditation, it's so difficult. But if you disappear, there's no traveler, there's no self doing the meditation, then the path is so easy. Meditation happens. Is that one of the signs of, of that, you, that you are actually, um, well, I say succeeding, that it implies that I'm succeeding, but is, it, is that one of the signs of success the signs uh, in, of in really getting into the present moment? It's one of that the, the m- amount of effort that you use is decreasing more and more and more and the sense of yourself is evaporating as well? Indeed. You'll begin to notice, you know, you're a psychologist... When you do something, that enhances the sense of a self. It makes it more solid. But when you really let go and the self disappears, there's no effort left because there's no one left to do the effort. You vanish, you're gone. And it's not the total of you, it's that controlling part of you has disappeared. The awareness is left. You're perfectly aware. There's no controller, there's no... The part of the self which you're most used to, the one who makes all the decisions, the one who's responsible and in charge of your life and areas of responsibility around you, that disappears. That's that part of you which we most identify with and which gives us the most trouble. Always having to react and take responsibility and take charge and fix things. That's why I often give those little stories that when people do nothing, things actually get much better. When the traffic lights don't work, they don't control the traffic, the traffic flows a little bit better. The story of in Jerusalem when the doctors went on strike for two weeks, I think it was actually three weeks, I read the article about a month ago again. The doctors went on strike for three three weeks and the death rate declined in the hospitals. (laughs) So when you stop doing things, when you stop trying to fix up your meditation, your meditation gets so peaceful. As a joke, because I'm a well-known meditation teacher now, as a joke, but it's a profound joke, and some of the jokes are not just for making people laugh, there's a deep meaning behind it. I say, Ajahn Brahm, I hold my hand up, I confess, I can't meditate. Ajahn Brahm's a hopeless meditator. I have to get out of the way. Ajahn Brahm has to vanish and disappear, and then meditation is so easy. So Chris, Thanks. you're a hopeless meditator, you always will be. But when you disappear, Chris, the meditation are just so easy, indeed. And you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, thank you for that question. It's a nice interesting one to end the session with. So now we can pay respects to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and then we can go and do whatever we need to do.